Or you deliver mail. How you like being Mr. Goody Two Shoes, eh? How's it feeling? Aha! Hello, Fallout fans. Did you spot the mini nuke tucked under the table at Majun's shop in Philly? That was one sneaky Easter egg, wasn't it? Also, the dangling green mutant arm from the second episode. And no one could have missed the not so subtle hint that Death Claws are coming to haunt the wasteland soon. These clues in the first season of Prime Video's Fallout series are delightful little gems for true blue fans of the gaming franchise. Set in the distant post apocalyptic future, the Fallout games have been around since 1997, garnering a massive fan base, and the TV series caters not only to that eagle-eyed audience, but also welcomes new viewers of the franchise, all of whom are now eagerly waiting for updates about the second season. Yes, it's happening for sure, and New Vegas is going to be a significant location in it. That's pretty much all we know so far, and fans want it to be jam-packed with all possible Fallout elements that didn't make it into the first season. Let's say we want Gary clones, and some glowing ghouls, and some centaurs, and more dark vaults, and okay, we need to stop. You get the drift, right? But what about some of the coolest Fallout characters that should make an entry in Season 2? Today's video is just about that. Let's begin, shall we? Before we get into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. But we're talking about making a significant investment based on a hypothetical. Mr. House. First on our list is Robert House, aka Mr. House, the mustachioed controller of New Vegas, who made a cameo in Season 1. He appeared in the final episode in Flashback, in the scene where the economic and tech powers of the world were brought together by Vault Tech to decide the future of humanity. As the top boss of the tech company Robco, Mr. House obviously got a seat at the table and raised concerns about the practicality of Vault's tech bunkers. In the games, Mr. House founded Robco and became a multi-billionaire owing to his scientific genius and business acumen, who predicted that a nuclear war is inevitable in the near future with complicated mathematical calculations. When Mr. House learned that vault Tech was willing to drop the bombs themselves, he took technologically advanced measures to secure Las Vegas, such as setting up devices to disable the incoming nukes and destroy those who would manage to get through. To ensure that he lives to see the world after the Great War, Mr. House performed augmentations on his body, placing his physical self in a life support system and connecting his brain to a supercomputer. After the Great War, Mr. House became the enigmatic controller of the New Vegas Strip and operated from within the Lucky 38 Hotel and Casino, with the mass-produced robot Securitrons under his command. His ultimate aim was to re-elevate New Vegas to its former pre-war glory through his mathematical deductions and lucrative trade deals. As per his own word, he has no interest in controlling others. But autocracy? Yes, that Vegas shall have. In the cliffhanging last scene of Fallout, the character Hank McLean flees off from the NCR headquarters and lands in New Vegas. And Mr. House might just be waiting for him there inside Lucky 38 Casino. You pay you for pay. You, enough? Caesar. Caesar is the megalomaniac, brutal co-founder, and leader of Caesar's Legion, one of the many factions of the post-war wasteland. He named himself Caesar after reading about the Roman dictator's conquests and equating his own aspirations with Caesar. We have cities of our own, but nothing compared to Vegas. Finally, my region will have its Rome, is his philosophy. Caesar's Legion is yet to fit into the TV show's storyline, and considering Caesar wants to capture New Vegas as the capital of his empire, this character may very well make an entry into the next season. But for that, Caesar must cross several hurdles, the biggest one being taking on Mr. House in his tech-savvy armory that protects the New Vegas Strip. Caesar is also constantly at war with the New California Republic, posing the greatest threat to the faction. Formerly Edward Sallow, Caesar was once a citizen of the NCR. He believed that the Great War was an opportunity for humanity to start over under one leadership, and those who think otherwise should be incinerated. In the game, Caesar has a lethal brain tumor and has taken a keen interest in the mysterious character of the Courier, and both these factors have stalled the progress of the Legion's conquests. Twist it up in this scene. From where you're kneeling must seem like an 18 karat run of bad luck. Truth is, the game was rigged from the start. Benny. This conniving gangster was perfectly voiced by Friends actor Matthew Perry, who was a huge fan of the Fallout games. And sadly, for Fallout fans, that's never going to transpire on screen ever. After Matthew Perry died last year, many fans refused to kill Benny in their playthroughs as an homage to the actor. There's a possibility that Benny might appear in the second season, as he served as the secondary antagonist of Fallout New Vegas. Benny originally hails from one of the three nomadic tribes that Mr. House took under his wing when he began controlling Vegas. Benny was even named one of the three initial tribes 
tribe chairman, and became the leader of them. This character's signature in-game elements are rigging any game he plays, and the black and white checkered coat he wears. But despite being under Mr. House's supervision, Benny constantly wants to one-up Mr. House and gain control of New Vegas. Reprogramming one of Mr. House's Securitrons, Benny learns of Mr. House's future plans and his deal with the Courier. He commits a cold-blooded murder that sort of sets the New Vegas game in motion, even if Benny doesn't appear in the next season. I didn't want to make a big deal about this until after we won, but, well... I found some code snippets in one of Mr. House's data banks that will let me- Yes Man. Yes Man was just another Securitron robot created to serve Mr. House, but one that was singled out and damaged by a pulse grenade. Benny was unable to fix it and it came to be modified by the humanitarian organization, Followers of the Apocalypse. In exchange for learning about Mr. House's plans, the Apocalypse member reprogrammed the robot into a literal Yes Man for Benny. This artificial personality was designed to perform the exact tasks he was told, including answering all questions about Mr. House's House's secret database. Yes Man was incapable of withholding any information, especially about Mr. House's plans, which allowed Benny to seemingly have the upper hand on his opponent. Thus, Yes Man became Benny's biggest weapon in his quest to take control of the strip for Mr. House. Benny planned to upload Yes Man's AI on the Lucky 38 Casino's mainframe, which would enable him to gain control of the strip and the Securitrons himself. It is Yes Man who informed Benny of Mr. House's highly valuable platinum chip and the possible routes to ambush the courier. Oh! Petro Chico Boy! Petro Chico Boy is here after my chicharrones! Oh, just a dream. Just a dream. Raul Tejada What do you think of Cooper Howard meeting Raul Tejada, another gunslinging ghoul in Season 2? We're not sure what Cooper was up to for the 200 years after the bombs dropped, and he may just have been friends with Raul Tejada, as this character appeared in the year 2281 in the games, and the TV show is set in the year 2296. This means the two ghouls could have bumped into each other sometime in the last 15 years. But hey, we're just thinking out loud here. However, the two ghouls came from completely different locations. While Cooper was living in upscale California when the bombs dropped, Raul was at a ranch on the outskirts of Mexico City. Raul's ghoulification began while living in the radiation-infected ruins of Mexico City. His strikingly noticeable cowboy costume and his gunslinging expertise earned him the Ghost of Mexico City title. This was both a blessing and a curse, and his reputation kept bounty hunters at bay while some wanted the glory of shooting him dead. Raul was eventually held captive by super mutants in the Black Mountain. Interestingly, Raul knows an awful lot about Mr. House and his former exploits, which may be a factor that can bring him back in Season 2. need to get nasty. How can I help you? You know where to find me. The Courier Now, who is this Courier that we keep talking about? As fans would know, this is the main protagonist and the player character of Fallout New Vegas, whose fate changes after Benny shoots this character at the beginning of the game. Presumed dead and abandoned at the Good Springs Cemetery in the game's introduction, the Courier turns out to be pretty much alive. Now it's up to the player to shape the Courier as either a villain or a hero through the rest of the game. As the Courier's name suggests, this character was transporting the Platinum Chip designed by Robert House to the Vegas Strip and was ambushed by Benny on the way. The courier was shot in the head by Benny and buried alive in the Great Cons, but the character managed to survive till Victor, a Securitron, recovered the courier. It'll be interesting to see how this player character storyline unfurls in the live-action version, as this character gets multiple endings in the game based on the player. White legs seem to be the only visitors we have these days, and I wouldn't have expected anyone from the Mojave to come looking for us. Joshua Graham. Remember we said Caesar was infamous for his brutality? He didn't even spare his Legion's co-founder Joshua Graham. Originally a member of the Mormon faith, Joshua Graham is just mentioned in the New Vegas game, but appears in the add-on Honest Hearts. Joshua Graham formed Caesar's Legion, along with Caesar, based on brutality and fear. For joining the Legion, Joshua betrayed his own people and turned into a monster that feeds on atrocities and war, till he became a victim of it by Caesar. This character could very well appear on the show, owing to his connection with Caesar and the Legion. Joshua led Caesar's Legion to a humiliating defeat at the First Battle of Hoover Dam, which infuriated Caesar enough to call for his partner in crime's execution. Joshua was covered in tar, set on fire alive, and then dropped into the Grand Canyon. He survived and came to be known as the Burned Man of the Wasteland. Joshua was immune to chemicals and medicines, and hence he had to tolerate the pain of replacing his bandages every day to prevent his oozing skin from infection. He traversed 400 miles for 30 days to reunite with his original tribe, who he had abandoned for Caesar's Legion and he was welcomed back like the prodigal son. When the legends of the Burn Man reached Caesar, he issued a death order for him. Joshua Graham eventually adopted a forgiving attitude towards Caesar and became the leader of the Dead Horses tribe. Welcome to Jacobstown, human. You're free to walk around, 
Just don't stare. Marcus. Now, we were all expecting to see super mutants in the second season, and what better way to introduce their kind than with the friendly elderly one, particularly Marcus. This guy was the sheriff of Broken Hills in Fallout 2, and in Fallout New Vegas, he became the mayor of Jacobstown, a town he named after his brotherhood friend Jacob. Marcus once served in the Unity, an army of super mutants created by the Master, who thought that the Great War was a chance to unite humanity under one mutated race. Marcus is an affable super mutant, who believes his transformation into a mutant was actually for the best. He was also of the opinion that if humans knew what's best for them, then an evil force like the Master wouldn't have been necessary at all. After the war, Marcus garnered a huge super mutant following and settled in the Black Mountain. This, however, did not work out because of the schizophrenic whims of the super mutant Tabitha who accompanied him, and Marcus was forced to leave Black Mountain with a handful of followers. He set up Jacobstown with the hope of successful trade relations with humans and started a research project to find a cure for schizophrenia. In case the Fallout characters land up in Jacobstown in Season 2, they might just encounter Marcus as the town's mayor. I don't know how to thank you for bringing Rhonda back to me, stranger. Tabitha. Now that we've spoken about a friendly super mutant, it'll be interesting to witness a vicious one in live action. Case in point, Tabitha the Bespectacled, a self-styled radio jock at Black Mountain. This first generation super mutant, belonging to an elite class known as the Nightkin, develops schizophrenia, induced by her gadget, a stealth boy. She only remains stable in the company of the Mr. Handy robot named Rhonda. And when that malfunctioned, Tabitha spiraled into a deranged mental state and took over the radio station at Black Mountain. Tabitha's hateful propaganda forced Marcus to relocate to Jacobstown, leaving her unopposed to establish the state of Utobitha and declare herself as the leader. As Raul Tejada fixed her broken radio equipment, she held the ghoul hostage, forcing him to fix anything and everything under the threat of execution. Tabitha then aired anti-human propaganda on her channel around the clock, which, to Tabitha's dismay, could not be broadcast beyond the Mojave Wasteland. In the games, Tabitha's fate depends upon the player who can either reason with her or kill her off. That's why her inclusion in the second season will be nothing short of intriguing. DJ 3Dog. We can't talk about radio and not mention 3Dog, the host and DJ of Galaxy News Radio in Washington, D.C. It's the year 2277, and 3Dog plays songs that were all the rage in the pre-war era, and also the ones that would have been aired if the bombs hadn't been dropped in 2077. Born in the post-war wasteland, 3Dog became an advocate of free speech, and also happened to stumble upon the radio station in D.C. On air, he imparts exactly that philosophy, takes digs at the evil paramilitary organization The Enclave, and counters them for their hateful propaganda. Even though 3Dog is based out of Washington, he might just make it to the second season of Fallout because he really wants to. We say this because Eric Todd Delmas, the actor who voiced the character in Fallout 3, tweeted an interesting idea. According to him, 3Dog can be the moniker of a radio DJ that operates out of a New Vegas casino. We like! As long as we're talking about radio jocks, Mr. New Vegas is also a great choice for a comeback, especially because he's the voice of Radio New Vegas, 200 years after the bombs fell. Created by Mr. House as an AI personality, Mr. New Vegas is only heard in the games and never really seen. You know what? I think I'm turning into a ghoul! Moira Brown this self-taught inventor and science enthusiast is like a breath of fresh air in the post-apocalyptic world. Moira Brown runs the Crater Science Supply Store within the fortified settlement of Megaton in the capital wasteland. The store, open from 8 to 8, also serves as her home, where she conducts all sorts of bizarre experiments. Moira Brown wants to help the survivors of the wasteland lead a better life and hence authors the Wasteland Survivor's Guide. But completing her guide was a struggle, as she constantly required volunteers to test practical situations out on the Wasteland. Completed in 2277, the Survival Guide was published 10 years later, and became increasingly popular for its insights into survival strategies, hunting, farming, and even recreation for the Wasteland folks. By the year 2297, Moira manages the subscription demands of her survival guide, and also began working on the biography of the lone survivor. Since the events of Fallout Season 1 wrap up in 2296, Moira fits into the timeline for the season just perfectly. The Mysterious Stranger We would love nothing more than to see the Mysterious Stranger appear in Season 2. This character is just as his name sounds, a stranger whose identity remains unknown throughout. The Mysterious Stranger actually is an in-game perk, and when the player selects this perk, this figure is randomly expected to appear in critical situations to help us out. Typically sporting a trench coat, hat, and gloves, the Mysterious Stranger would attack the opponent with his gun, delivering considerable damage to the enemy and saving the day for the player. What makes this stranger all the more mysterious is that he never 
never speaks and that his face is often concealed. Introduced in the first Fallout game, the mysterious stranger has become a Fallout staple, operating as the guardian angel of the player. However, some theories suggest that he may be a lone ranger with a personal agenda to aid the Wastelanders in need. Maybe in Season 2, the mysterious stranger can be the guiding light for Lucy or randomly help her in a precarious situation. Who sent you? I ain't talking. They tried to get me to talk before, but I didn't say nothing. And I don't aim to now. No Bark Noonan There's plenty of room for conspiracy theories in the Fallout universe, especially because the world-ending bomb dropping was a big conspiracy in itself. And that brings us to the slightly frenzied character No Bark Noonan. He is a self-proclaimed scientist who comes up with the wackiest of conspiracy theories and shouts them across the town of Novak. When asked about his background, all Noonan says is that his skull has been pierced by rad scorpion stings, and this probably solves the mystery behind his frenzied behavior. His conspiracy theories are often laced with hidden truths, and that's how he likes to explain his No Bark Noonan moniker. He says, and we quote, They know I ain't just barking here. What I say has got bite, cause it's the truth. Maybe in Fallout Season 2, No Bark Noonan will have some bizarre but potentially true theories about who really runs the post-apocalyptic world. I, I wish I had something to give you. I... Wait, what about punching? That's the gift that keeps on giving. Veronica Santangelo. This character would be an unusual entry in Season 2. In the first season, we've met the Squires, the Paladins, the Clerics, and the Knights of the Brotherhood of Steel. But Veronica is a scribe, and her inclusion would mean viewers can learn more about the Brotherhood's history and way of life. In the game, Veronica serves as a companion of the Courier, and on the show, she can play a similar role to Maximus. By the end of Season 1, the Brotherhood assumes that Maximus took out the NCR leader Moldaver, and he must now lead the way for future adventures. In that sense, it would be helpful to have someone like Veronica to guide Maximus along. Long. Veronica has a tragic backstory in the games. Brought up as an orphan by the elder named Father Elijah, she was also led along a delusional path by her foster parent, something she realized too late. Veronica eventually became critical of the Brotherhood's policies and kept looking for ways to make the faction change for the better. If you're an enemy of the NCR, you're an enemy of mine. Get out of my sight. <laughs> Craig Boone. Last but not least, one character that has the potential to be an impactful antagonist in the second season is Craig Boone, a product of tragedy. He started off as a remarkable sharpshooter for the National California Republic, but the massacre at Bitter Spring shook him to the core. He was consumed by guilt after shooting down innocent civilians in order to kill the Great Khans. Boone eventually found peace with a woman named Carla, who soon became his wife. When Carla was pregnant, she was kidnapped by Legion slavers, which led to two tragic incidents. First, Boone realized that his best friend had something to do with Carla's disappearance. And second, Boone had no choice but to find and kill Carla in order to save her from being auctioned off by Legion slavers. Craig Boone returned to his duties as a town watchman in Novak, but was completely filled with rage and anguish. Such a character, consumed by hatred and vengeance, is a suitable fit for the new antagonist in Fallout 2. Marvelous Verdict There's no denying that Season 1 introduced some pretty cool characters to the Fallout franchise, starting with the doe-eyed vault dweller Lucy and her creepy dad Hank, to the gunslinging ghoul and the sneaky knight Maximus. But the season's ending leaves room for more characters to just glide into the storyline. And these new entrants may be the key to solving what really brought Hank McClain to New Vegas. Is it where the vault tech headquarters are? Is Mr. House really controlling the post-apocalyptic world? Will the ghoul find his wife in New Vegas? Only time will tell. With that food for thought, we'll wrap up our video. Meanwhile, why don't you tell us which other character you would love to see in Season 2? Drop your views in the comments section below. See you super soon! And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone! Thank you.